So something you hear from people all the time about the universe is that it is expanding. And we've known this for nigh on a century now, that when we look out into space, all the other galaxies are moving away from us. They're all redshifted. And so people tend to ask, well, if all the galaxies are moving apart because the universe is expanding, then how come galaxies collide? So there's a constant push-pull going on in the universe all the time between gravity on one side and the expansion of the universe on the other. So we know gravity exists because, well, we're not currently floating off the surface of the Earth and the Earth is still going around the Sun and the stars are all going around the centre of the Milky Way. And it's from observing those kind of things that we've been able to piece together a theory of gravity, i.e. equations which describe what we're seeing. Our best theory is that of general relativity, Einstein's theory. And every place that we've tested that theory, it's been right. So the orbit of Mercury or gas around the outskirts of a black hole. So much so that now we can actually employ those equations in technology. And so every time you pull out your phone and use your GPS to find out where you are in the world, satellites around the Earth are using Einstein's theory of general relativity to help correct for gravitational influences and figure out where you are on planet Earth. On the other side, you've got the expansion of the universe, something we've accepted is happening since the 1920s, when Hubble first looked out at Andromeda Nebula and found out that it wasn't a nebula in our own Milky Way, you know, only say 100,000 light years away, but that it was a galaxy of stars in its own right that was actually millions of light years away. And when he looked at other galaxies in the sky as well, he found that the more distant they were, the more their light had been redshifted, which meant that they were moving away from us at a faster rate. So if all the galaxies in the universe are moving away from us, then if we sort of rewind time, we obviously end up in that sort of big bang scenario where the universe starts from this sort of infinitesimally small, incredibly dense point. Hubble's discovery triggered so much debate about the universe and whether it was formed in a big bang and what its current state was as well. But eventually this idea of an expanding universe in the big bang became accepted as more and more evidence was found Say, for example, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background in the 1960s by Penzias and Wilson, which was kind of like an echo of the radiation left over from the Big Bang. Now, we don't really know what's causing this expansion of the universe. We give it a name, we call it dark energy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we know what it is. We also know how much of the universe's energy budget is in dark energy. We've been able to calculate that from studying the early universe and the cosmic microwave background and the expansion of the universe as well, and found that it's about 75% of all of the universe's energy budget has gone into dark energy that's causing this expansion. Rather than being locked into matter, so for example, normal matter, which is about 5% of the universe's energy budget, the rest of which is dark matter. So it has a name, and we know how much of the universe's energy budget it takes up, but that's really all we know. Like, we don't really know how it's causing the expansion. That's something that people are still trying to answer, like, in research departments across the world right now. So if you ask me in the comments, I'm not gonna know. <laughs> So whilst we think that this dark energy pervades all of the universe and all space, because whichever direction we look into, whatever distances, we see this expansion happening, gravity is a bit different though, because first of all, it depends on how close you are to something, and then also how heavy the object is that you're close to. So the equation that we always quote is g, the gravitational constant, times the mass of one object, the mass of the second object, divided by their separation squared. This is why, you know, we can launch rockets off the Earth that have managed to take the Voyager probes completely out of the solar system. As long as we gave them enough energy to overcome that force of gravity, then eventually they would escape the gravitational pull of the sun when they got to a big enough distance. So for small distances, like in the solar system, and for huge masses, like for galaxies, then gravity dominates. It wins out over dark energy. It has a stronger pull than the push of the expansion of the universe outwards. It's why the Earth isn't moving away from the sun because of the expansion of space. We're at the same distance away from the sun all the time because gravity holds us in that position against the push outwards of the expansion of space. And it's similarly why stars in our own Milky Way are not moving away from the sun because they're held in that position by the whole gravity of the whole Milky Way system. 
but it's also why galaxies can also collide and merge because if you have galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars and then also containing dark matter that's like five, ten times more than that as well, then that force of gravity pulling those two massive objects together is going to be huge. And so even if they are millions of light years away, that force of gravity is still going to be strong enough to eventually pull them together and beat the push of the expansion of the universe outwards so that they eventually collide and merge. Which is why it's not correct to say that all galaxies in the universe are moving away from us, because the Milky Way is part of a little local group of galaxies, which includes the large and small Magellanic clouds, which will be familiar sights in the southern sky to those of you in the southern hemisphere, and then also the Andromeda galaxy, a very familiar sight to people in the northern hemisphere. And because of the force of gravity on all of these galaxies in this group, they are all destined to one day merge and become a single galaxy. So Andromeda is not redshifted. Its light hasn't been stretched by the expansion of space. Instead, its light is blue shifted because Andromeda is actually moving towards us. So the light has been squashed as it's given off from Andromeda on its way to us. So because of that blue shift, we tend to say that it means that Andromeda is coming towards us, but that's not quite the right language because Andromeda is much bigger than the Milky Way, sort of like three to four times bigger. Andromeda has a trillion stars in it, whereas the Milky Way is something like 200 to 400 billion at last count. And so whilst yes, they will both be exerting a force of gravity on each other, Andromeda will be exerting the bigger pull on the Milky Way, and so technically we're the ones moving towards Andromeda. And when we get there, we are going to collide with it and merge. The probability of two stars colliding though is very, very low. Check out my previous video that I've done on that. And what will happen is that, that beautiful spiral structure that we think the Milky Way has, and the beautiful spiral structure that we've seen that Andromeda has is gonna get torn apart by all those forces of gravity, the stars will get flung out everywhere, and eventually the stars will settle down on these random chaotic orbits, giving us this kind of giant blob of a remnant galaxy that people like to call Milkameda. Oh, and by the way, this is happening like four billion years in the future. I don't wanna panic anybody. I don't want anyone to have to think they have to go running out and buying like galactic merger insurance today, because it's so far in the future. But after we've merged with Andromeda, the question is, you know, will we merge with anything else again? But it's quite unlikely because our local group of galaxies is in what we call a supervoid. And a supervoid is essentially a very low density part of the universe. They've got incredibly low numbers of galaxies in that region of space than you would expect from like the normal density. And it means that gravity's got absolutely no chance of winning in those regions. And the expansion of space is going to dominate so those supervoids just get bigger and bigger and bigger, leaving the galaxies that were originally in them extremely isolated in the vastness of space. But it all depends on whether gravity or dark energy, this expansion of space, will win the overall fight in the end. This is what cosmologists are currently trying to measure. They're trying to determine how much mass is there in total in the universe and is that enough to counteract against the expansion of space? And so with the equations that we have to describe gravity and the expansion of the universe, you can then work out what the critical density of matter would be in the universe for those two things to perfectly balance. That's one scenario that we could end up with. The expansion slows down and we end up with this nice happy equilibrium where the universe reaches a specific size and we don't grow any further. But it could be that once we've measured the amount of mass in the universe, it's actually less than that critical density, in which case there's nothing to stop the expansion of the universe. It would continue accelerating for eternity, moving everything in the universe away from each other, isolating galaxies in the vastness of space, so that when you look up, you see a dark night sky. Or you could have so much mass in the universe that its density is above that critical density, in which case, you'd completely halt the expansion and you would draw everything back in again under the force of gravity, reeling everything back down to that infinitesimal point where the Big Bang was in what we like to call a big crunch 
or a gnab gib, as some people like to call it, because it's big bang backwards. So this is what cosmologists are trying to do right now, is measure that density of matter in the universe. And there's lots of different teams doing this worldwide, using lots of different methods. And what's really interesting is that as the decades wear on and they drill down how precise they're able to get that value as technology improves and the different data techniques improve as well, we get closer and closer to thinking that we live in a universe which has that exact critical density to balance gravity and dark energy perfectly. Just a little hair quaff before we start. Anywho. Oh my universe, my nails are shocking. I really need to paint them again. Just no one look at my nails, okay, for the whole video. I'm just gonna like claw nail like this the entire time on the other side. So let's just sort of think about what each of those two things. I'll wait for you then, Mr. Motorbike. Psh, Mrs. Motorbike, I don't know, shouldn't assume. That's general relativity, Einstein's theory that he came up with to describe how gravity, ow. <laughs> Whereas the Milky Way is say like 200 to 400 stars. Star, just, two, just 200 stars, that's all there is. It's, or a gnab gib, or a gnab big, no, or a gnab gib. I am so sick of running as fast as I can. I am so sick of expanding as fast as I can. Wondering if I could get there quicker if it wasn't for gravity. That does not fit. I'm so sorry, Taylor Swift. 